Today, we're talking to Joe Bob Briggs about The Last Drive-In. And if it wasn't for Joe Bob and Monster Vision, I might not even be making movie reviews the way I am today. But first, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Age of Origins. Available for mobile, Age of Origins is a tower defense game where you play as a commander in a ruined world, defending their city from invading waves of zombies. Build your base to fend off the zombie hordes with machine gun towers, rocket turrets, and EMP towers, to name a few, each featuring unique traits that combo together to help you survive each round. Or challenge players from around the world in massive PvE matches that take you to sprawling locations across the wasteland. Recruit special officers that increase your army's effectiveness and give you special abilities, like Lucy, a biochemical zombie that you can convert to your side with the ability to control zombie troops. And control the battlefield with colossal titans that deal out overwhelming damage to your foes. You can even build your own car and drag race through waves of enemies and defend your base by controlling gigantic defense cannons. To hop in and try Age of Origins yourself, just click the link in my description to download it and net yourself a gift pack worth $60. All right, so here comes the part where I introduce the guest. So I guess I will say you are a uh, author, uh, film curator, host, personality, maybe stand-up comedian of sorts. How's that all sound? Uh, it sounds okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't uh, you know I I you're right. I've 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 done this in a lot of different ways, but it always goes back to the movies. Mm -hmm. You know, most of what I do is movie oriented. So. Mm -hmm. So if you've seen our interview with Joe Bob Briggs from the last time, which was like, when was that? That was, that was like 2018. Okay. Right yeah. before The Last Drive-In started. So now we have, um, The Last Drive-In's out now. So it's it's been out for a few years and um, we, we can actually, we talk about it because I've seen it now. So We're actually yeah. in the fourth season of, of The Last Drive-In. 100 episodes, right? Uh, we just did our 100th um, and 101st movie. And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it kind of got out of control. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like you said on the last interview, you said, um, it's going to be like the same show as Monster Vision, just with a different name. And that's exactly what it is. It's, I think it's even better than Monster Vision because it's, it's HD for one thing. Uh, it's uncensored. Uh, it just seems like you have a lot more freedom with it. Do you feel that way? Um, yeah. And what happened is the audience got smarter mm -hmm. because when I did monster vision, there was no internet. And so now if you say, I'm sure you know this, if you say something wrong on a show, um, you know, it five seconds later, mm -hmm. 20,000 people tell you about it, <laughs> they yeah, tell yeah. You just how wrong you were and why <laughs> you're wrong. And so, uh, the level of detail that I get into on these movies, uh, is, uh, fraught with danger <laughs> um but also uh you know the internet is often wrong too uh because what happens is it's like a a big closed circuit of of um like if something that's if something sounds like it might reasonably be true but it's not true mm -hmm. it'll get repeated nine thousand times on the internet especially if it's interesting like oh, okay. you, know, you know if it's if if you say uh, brontosaurus has had big dicks, <laughs> then, then that's going to get repeated. Wow! Like, like you know what like, that kind of reminds me of is um how they said King Kong versus Godzilla had two different endings. Yeah, and I think it might have been something Forey Ackerman started it, for, for the longest time. A lot of people thought that movie had two endings. Yeah, I mean, once if it's if it's interesting and remotely believable. It'll get repeated over and over and over and over again until it's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or it could be like partially true. Like the right. Kong and Godzilla thing, I guess technically there were two endings. One where you hear both the monsters roar, but in the uh, American one, you just hear Kong roar at the end. But the okay. idea was that Kong wins the American version and then Godzilla wins the Japanese version. Okay, but, so uh, it was a sound effect difference. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. technically different. So but. technically it's two, it's two endings, right? Yeah. But the fans are relentless. Uh, <laughs> 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 and they're relentless and unforgiving. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you got a lot of support, like people really are digging the show, right? 
Uh, yeah, we, we not only have the show now, we have, we have an annual event called Joe Bob's Drive-In Jamboree that's every summer at a drive-in where we do sort of the same stuff we do on the show, but we do it live. We call it the Drive-In Woodstock, mainly because last year we, we, it was all muddy. It was up at the Mahoning. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You and Darcy were really busy during that whole thing. Is a uh, yeah. You were like signing till like what five in the morning. We were something? signing till five in the morning. We we sort of dis- discovered that, you know, people want to be at these live events for, you know, they want to meet us, but they also want to meet each other because they know each other. People in the audience they know each other online, and so they go to the live event partly to just mingle with live bodies mm-hmm. uh, instead of just online presences. It was so, nice, yeah, because it's been a long time since, you know, we've been able to get all together. So I remember when I went to the drive and it was like, oh, wow, we're here with people, and it's 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 cool. Um, it was yeah. very muddy, yes. The the rain was was insane. Yeah, but you filmed one of them there. Yeah, and, we um, filmed, a, a, we filmed a, actually a, a, a live episode of the, of um, Monster Vision there, uh, Monster Vision, of The Last Drive-In. Mm-hmm. As, as you pointed out, I've done the same show three times. So yeah. it doesn't matter what, the name changes, but the show stays the same. Yeah, of course, no. just to clarify, the old one was uh, uh, the I, Drive-In Theater. Originally I did and... Drive-In Theater on the movie channel, mm-hmm. then I did uh, Monster Vision on TNT, and now I'm doing the last drive-in on Shutter, which is part, of, which is AMC's uh, streaming service. I mean, we watch the movie and we talk about the movie. <laughs> That's what we do. Uh huh. So. I like that it feels, you know, live. Like when you, um, when the last drive-in streams and everybody is kind of tuned in at the same time, it kind of has that, you know, live feel like television did. So it really does feel to me, kind of like a, a throwback. Because when I was watching Monster Vision in the 90s, it was like, it was really exciting because it was, uh, you know, it was live and you knew some of your friends might be tuned in at the same time. Like, oh, did you see that movie last night? And um, it was also my introduction to a lot of those movies. Yeah. A lot of them I hadn't seen before. And the same thing in Last Drive-In, there's quite a few that I have not seen. Like, um, Tammy and the T Rex. Um, yeah, that movie was crazy. I, <laughs> <laughs> I love Tammy and the T Rex. Yeah, and like all, all the gore in it and everything. Like I heard there was a version. You know, you talked about it. How it's it was. Uh, they cut a lot of that gore out later. But I don't understand how the movie would even work without the gore. Well, it didn't work. Uh, the The guy who uh, produced it uh, had never worked in film before, and he he decided at the last minute he tr- wanted to make it <clears throat> a PG movie. And he started taking all this stuff out of it, and they released it, and it was a big. It was not a hit. And then years later, uh, some some people who heard about uh, what what had actually been shot uh, found the old footage. Actually, I think it only existed in one remaining print that was in Germany or somewhere. And um, they restored it, and you know, it's it's sort of become. It's this. It's it's now. It has a whole new audience uh, because of that. And of course, um, Denise Richards is uh, wonderful in it. I think it's that's her debut role, mm-hmm. and Before it's actually one of the best things she ever did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the dinosaur in the film was, I guess, you know, the plot for anyone who hasn't seen it. Like this guy's brain gets put into the T Rex, but then it's also kind of like a sort of a romantic, sort of quirky. Comedy. Well, the the guy but that like, Denise Richards is in love with his his is killed, but his brain is saved inside the uh, T Rex. Yeah. But she remains in love with him, even though he's now a T Rex. Yeah, and like <laughs> <laughs> the thing I found so weird and so um, creepy about the movie, like more so than the gore, was just the the T Rex's expressions because it's this this big animatronic T Rex, and it's sort of they sort of try to make it look like it's crying sometimes, but it's just yeah. got that weird face. It was yeah. made, actually, we found the T-Rex. It was missing for many years, and we found it. Uh, Ripley's had it at one of its museums in Texas. Really? And apparently moves around. It's not always at the same place. But oh, wow. um, But uh, Ripley's owns the T-Rex from Tammy and the T-Rex. I don't think they realize what they have huh. because they just <laughs> treat it as an animatronic dinosaur. Wow. And but it's a huh. famous animatronic dinosaur who was in love with Denise Richards. So yeah. <laughs> they, they should point that out when you go to the Ripley's yeah. Museum. Wow. <laughs> Have they had to do any like refurbishing on that thing? Is I'm sure not... they did because oh. it looks like um, 
It didn't look that sturdy, hmm. okay. <laughs> even in the movie. Wow. So it's lasted longer than the uh, the T-Rex in Jurassic Park, because that thing, I think, was just cannibalized after the film to make other animatronics, I guess. Oh, but, boy, they don't understand. Yeah. They don't understand how much money they can get for stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another one I saw on there that I hadn't heard of was Society. Um, oh my God! Yeah. Brian Usna, the the producer of Reanimator, in his directing debut. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that Society is one of the most. Um, what would you call it? It's like it has some of the most brutal gore uh, images of of any film that we've shown. I think. Yeah. <laughs> and it's one thing to see, you know, an axe cutting somebody's head off or something, but this was like gore that I hadn't even imagined could be made. <laughs> it's just like, just like bodies and flesh, just sort of like, just, uh, just kind of ripping a new, a little bit like John Carpenter's The Thing, but yeah, yeah that was a weird, weird movie. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of those love, or, love it or hate it movies where... You know, half the audience says, never show anything like that again. And the other half <laughs> says, I've watched it 30 times. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like Cannibal Holocaust. That's one that you, you watch once or I guess you're somebody who watches it over and over. Yeah, I mean. For me, it was once. I, okay. I don't need to see it again. <laughs> well, Cannibal Holocaust, we made a special arrangement for Cannibal Holocaust. You could watch it with the um, animal scenes removed or you could watch the full version. You know, uh, when the Italians in the early 80s, um, actually early 70s, or throughout the 70s, were making these um, cannibal films. It was, a, it, was their own, it was an Italian genre right from the beginning. And, you know, usually it's like, you know, uh, stupid European people or stupid American people go into the jungle thinking they're going to investigate the cannibals and they become uh, dinner for the cannibals. That's basically the plot of all of those movies. Mm -hmm. And then they come back, you know, one of them survives and comes back to civilization and tells the story. And so there were at least two dozen of these, all made in Italy. And one thing I didn't really know about the Italians, but the Italians are not sentimental about animals they are not at all i don't think there's many PETA organizations in in italy maybe there are today but there weren't in the 1970s okay yeah and so when they wanted to show how the cannibals you know um kill and eat turtles they would just kill some turtles or when they you know and and show and graphically show how they kill them with the machetes and whatever and and um uh are monkeys i mean that um, when they were making Cannibal Holocaust, you know, the director, Ruggiero Deodato, said, you know, we're going we're gonna to kill this monkey. And some of the crew said, I, you know, I don't think we should kill the monkey. And, but the natives that they were using as extras in the movie says, who gets to eat the monkey once we kill it? That was all they were interested oh. in. <laughs> and, so, and so he justified killing the monkey because he said it was used for food. You know, well, and it apparently it was a delicacy among the people of South America that they were they were filming down in the Amazon. And so, obviously, now we're like how many years later? We're like fifty, almost fifty years later. We have all kinds of laws and rules and regulations that you don't harm animals in the slightest when you make a movie, and yet this movie exists. And so a lot of people believe you shouldn't show that movie at all. It should be destroyed. You should never again be able to watch it. And then other people say, well, you know, it exists. We're not going to we're not going to kill any more animals. No animal is going to suffer just because we watch the movie. We should watch the movie. You know, it's it's a it's a legitimate subgenre of the 70s and everything. So this debate goes on and Nobody wants to tangle with animal rights people. Nobody. It's like it's that's the, nothing good is going to come of that. And so uh, we we bent over backwards to warn people, tell people this other uh, uh, version of the movie exists. But we still there were so many people who said, "Yeah, I will not be watching your show that night. I will not be watching that." Oh, promoting okay. Cannibal Holocaust, <laughs> you know, so. Or at least don't watch it while you're eating, as you say a lot on the show. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, this is one you don't want to watch when you're eating. 
Yeah. Also, um, Deathgasm was a more recent film on there that I you know hadn't seen, so that was really cool. Yeah, Deathgasm is a New Zealand film that sort of harkens back to the '80s films, like uh, Trick or Treat, uh, uh, the films where you know there was the the movement uh, in America to to label music because it was because it had demonic messages and. If you played the record backwards, it had these messages from Satan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so there were all these activist groups who said, you know, we need to clamp down on these uh, Satanist rockers. And so a series of movies were made by rock and roll people saying, yeah, we are Satanist rockers. And <laughs> cause the plot of every one of those movies is, yeah, actually, Tipper Gore is right. Every, everything she says is correct. <laughs> we are agents of Satan, and, and so and so. Deathgasm was one of the latest. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, that, it's like New Zealand is kind of doing the same. That subgenre kind of died yeah. out in the nineties. New Zealand says, "Okay, we're gonna do. We're gonna go back to that subgenre." Maybe it, maybe that maybe that movement just arrived in New Zealand in 2015 or something. But mm -hmm. anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway, they did a pretty good one. It's a pretty good uh, it's a pretty good version of that story. Yeah, there are a lot of bands nowadays like Ghosts that do like a theatrical kind of Satan thing. Like they make it like, oh, this is evil. This is you know, th th we're an evil band, but it's you can tell it's like you know, it, it's a it's a show. It's it's entertainment. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like. Um, you know, neo pagans or mm -hmm. neo uh, witches or whatever they do the they do the ceremonies, but they, then they then they go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean there are the real thing too, but like like there's the uh, the the metal bands that like go around like burning churches down, stuff like that. Like that that exists, and that's like that scary shit. But uh, so there is the real thing too, but. Aren't they all in are, Norway? A lot of them are up in like Scandinavia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's you know. a really good documentary I saw that in. It was um it's by this guy named Sam Dunn. He does a lot of these metal documentaries and uh he did this one called uh, Metal a Headbanger's Journey. Um and then there's one he did called Global Metal. Um he's done a bunch of stuff. It's really cool. Yeah, but, there's uh, that there's that whole movement to return to the culture of the Vikings. You know, and the, yeah. the, there's all that Norse stuff that goes on up there, and we just we just recently did a a, a show on um, uh, we want to bring back um, Valpurgis Nacht, which is only which is oh, only yeah. practiced in Europe. Oh yeah, it's uh, like April thirtieth. Like yeah, the night of yeah, the same, yeah, you yeah. know that you know it's yeah, like most yeah. people I, I I say it and they don't know what I'm talking about, but the, <laughs> the second, other Halloween, it's yeah. the other Halloween, and yeah. they and they, it's a big deal in mm -hmm. Europe. And it's a cool holiday because it's all about um, sex and alcohol and fire, which is probably – and witches. It's like you, yeah, you, yeah. you go up on the mountain and you burn up the witches, you know? Yeah, and yeah. So it's a really cool holiday, like yeah, this yeah. pagan holiday from um, – and and we don't really do it over here, but they really do it in Europe. They do oh, it wow. in, in Germany, like, Scandinavia. Still. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it's like – it has this weird name, so that's why it never crossed the ocean. Valpurgis yeah, Nacht. Who's going to do that? W, but Valpurgis <laughs> Nacht because yeah. it's, it's German, I think. Right? Yeah, it's German. Yeah. I mean, it's named after a Catholic saint because the Catholics got weird about, you know, we don't like this Beltane thing going on where you run off in the forest and have sex and burn the witches. We don't really <laughs> like this, and so they they had this saint named Walpurga, mm -hmm. uh, who was a woman who like. She would, if you had trouble with a witch, you could go to her and she would cleanse you or get rid of the witch's spells or whatever. And so they said, we're going to just change this holiday and honor her and honor all the other great Catholic saints. And so you can stop going into the woods and all that. And, and of course, what do the people do? They say, okay, we'll call it your name that you want to call it, but we're just going to do the same thing that we've always done. <laughs> I wonder so, if it's in any way connected with St. George's um, Day, because in Bram Stoker's Dracula, they say the night of May 4th, when Jonathan Harker's traveling to the castle, the townspeople warn him, um, you know, tonight is the the night of 
St. George's Eve and at, at the stroke of midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway. And yeah. that's when they give him the crucifix before he goes to the castle. Because in the, in the Lugosi film, they, they actually called it Walpurgis Night. They, they use that one instead. But they both occur around the same time. Yes. Even though St. George's Eve is May 4th, it used to be... No, I'm sorry. It used to be May 4th, I guess, at the time Bram Stoker wrote it. Later on, they moved it. I think now it's like earlier in April. Now it's point. always celebrated April 30th, the night of April 30th, May 1st. Mm. But the pagans, the, 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 the holiday is actually called Beltane. The, the pagan holiday was called Beltane. And the, it was halfway between the solstices. So you had to calculate mm. it. And so um, it could be on any day between um, April 30th and May 6th, I think. And so if you, so yeah, it could easily be St. George's Day. And so, yeah, I think they're all talking about the same thing. It's this European tradition that at that point where spring becomes, sort of becomes summer, the idea is like, it's the point at which the world of darkness and the world of light yeah. are close together so people can pass over from the land of the mm. dead to the land of the living and vice yeah. versa. And so you want to be careful that night because the sprites and fairies and elves are out there and they're going to take advantage of you and the, and especially the witches because the witches are up on the mountain having sex with Satan. <laughs> and so we got if you see any witches, we're going to burn them up. And so there's you build bonfires and and so it's a really cool holiday. Yeah. And there's uh, there's a lot of alcohol associated with it. There's meads and liqueurs and wines and stuff that you drink <laughs> only on Valpurgis well, Nacht. And and so yeah, that's like. The Germans and the Scandinavians, they understand all that stuff. We not, Over here, not so much. We mm. do. Halfway to Halloween. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. We don't really... <laughs> so I guess we're working <laughs> like, on it. We've got we're a like, holiday. Yeah. We've got a holiday. Let's we have just, two let's, Halloweens in the year. Yeah, we let's could, just do it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I'm all for doing two Halloweens. Yeah, yeah. but you're right. Oh. It's, it's, it's at the beginning of every... Um, um, Dracula movie, Nosferatu, all, all those movies. Uh, yeah, they were mentioned in with, some way or another. We, but, yeah. you know, we have to get to the end before nightfall. Uh huh. Yeah, it's like that very first scene where they're going through the Borgo Pass. And, yeah, uh, they usually don't mention it by any name, but the few that do, it's like I, I think, I think they say Saint George's in the um, uh, the BBC version from seventy seven, and then they do it in uh, they might do it in the uh, the Jesus Franco one. I once did a, a elaborate video uh, comparing all the Draculas, but I do remember oh. in the Lugosi one, it was Valpurgis Night. I, I believe in the, the Spanish version of that as well. How uh, many Draculas are there? Oh, so many now. I don't know. I, uh, when I did my comparison, I picked 12, the Dracula dozen, because those ones were the most, they watched. followed the, well, may, maybe the most watched too, but they followed the Stoker novel closer than many of the others. Um, yeah. So I was just kind of comparing all the uh, bullet points from the novel and just like, okay, does it have the crucifix? Does it have this? You know, the one that came out on top was the BBC 77 version. Really? Yeah. I think almost every Dracula movie is better than the Dracula novel. <laughs> I, it's an example of like a book that's better when you film it. Sort of like Gone with the Wind is the same way. A movie, you know... The, if you, people go back and they read Gone with the Wind because they like the movie, and then they say, "Man, this is a long, boring book." Oh, yeah. And <laughs> and the same thing with Bram Stoker's Dracula is told in that letter writing style, oh, yeah. epistolary found style, kind of style. Like yeah. if it were footage, it'd be found footage. But yeah, yeah. His writings. And actually, when Bram Stoker died, nobody mentioned Dracula in his obituary. Mm. He was mentioned really? as he was ma mainly celebrated for being a theater manager some famous theater in london hmm. um and so <laughs> it was only later when when filmmakers you know uh, interpreted the story that it became uh, the phenomenon it is probably i mean would you say they're like more horror movies based on dracula than any other single uh source maybe i i think um, more than frankenstein don't you think yeah i i know frankenstein's up there sherlock holmes is up there well um, yeah i don't call that horror though oh yeah sherlock yes. holmes yeah well, literary okay i mean i mean if just you, horror if, literary. if you if you want to just just go by literary 
It's probably Zane Gray, the guy who did all the Western novels. Oh, there's okay. Probably, there's probably five or 600 Zane mm-hmm. Gray um, Westerns, <laughs> you know. But in terms of, of horror, uh, I, think, I think Dracula is probably the number one. Probably, yeah. The number one sort of horror myth. Mm, right? the I know, it might be a zombie thing today. I mean, there oh. may be, there may be <laughs> Maybe, more zombie yeah. stories. Yeah. I don't know. Because I guess the character Dracula's public domain, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it wasn't when Nosferatu, the silent film, was made. That's oh, uh, yeah. that's why they got sued by yeah, yeah. Bram Stoker's widow. Mm-hmm. But, um, uh, but it is now. And, um, you know, Night of the Living Dead, which started the whole zombie craze, um, was really a ripoff of the Matheson novel, uh, I Am Legend. Oh, yeah, which was actually made into a film even before, with yeah, Vincent Price. Yeah, I think it's been made um, two or three times. And, yeah, but, but, but before Night of the Living Dead, I think they did um, uh, the, the Last Man on Earth was the title, yeah. And exactly, that, yeah. And that film is also public domain, but you watch and you're like, wait a minute, this looks a lot like Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, and but I, I think, I don't know if I Am Legend is in public domain, probably not, but... It probably spawned more as many movies as Dracula. Yeah, because you know? then there was the um, the Omega Man one also with uh, Charlton Heston. Um, so yeah, they have made that a lot. Uh, and I Am Legend with uh, Will Smith. Yeah, I do know that. I was looking into which movies had the most sequels, and I think Charlie Chan might have had the most. You know, because first you think like James Bond and stuff like that, but then you you know that's what I always heard. It was yeah. James Bond. It's not Charlie Chan has I, more. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I mean if. I don't know if all of them can be considered straight up sequels because I haven't seen even like half of them. But, uh, but like you know, Tarzan had a lot of films, and it would usually be the same actor, but then they would pass it on to another actor, like they do with James Bond. Those are serials that probably that aired in the '30s when the, mm-hmm. when when you would you know you when you went to the theater in the '30s, you would have an A movie, a B movie, a serial, a cartoon, a newsreel. And some and some shorts, and the serial is like this genre that doesn't exist anymore. Where yeah. technically it's true, every single episode of it is a sequel because it, they have the cliffhanger. Oh yeah, you know? like, I guess it kind of you got to come into... back next week to see. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like TV. I guess it just turned into TV eventually. Yeah, exactly. It was probably it was probably a TV series before TV series existed. So, but if you're talking about big budget movies, I, I do think James Bond is the is the sequel winner. But I'm not sure. By the way, thank you and Darcy <laughs> for the uh, Silver Bolo Award on uh, Last Drive-In. Yeah, we have yeah. these Silver Bolo Awards that we give for excellence in. Uh, and it's mostly horror media. You, you're not horror media, but but uh, we do horror. Alt, alternative. You include horror, and so it's like alternative media. So it's everything mm-hmm. from you know websites to pop, podcasts to um, you know independent uh, films to uh, live theater. We gave we gave an award for live theater. So, uh, but yeah, they're like the outside the mainstream. Um, awards mm. and uh, no, you you were an obvious choice. Um, there's so many people that have come up to me at uh, at conventions and other places where I've performed, and say, um, I didn't know who you were, and then I was watching James Rolfe on uh, <laughs> and and, and uh, he was talking about you, and so I checked out your show. So you had a big impact on the on the first year of the of the last drive-in because. Um, uh, especially with much younger guys who weren't around for Monster Vision, um, you know, they were like, you know, I, so I checked it out because James said to check it out. So you know, oh, so, cool, nice. you, <laughs> so you, your influencer cred re- <laughs> really helped me out when that show started. Uh, oh, so cool. thank, thank you, thank you for that. Oh yeah, uh, no problem. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's very yeah. surreal. It's funny. It's it's kind of more surreal when I'm on the other side of the glass when I'm watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I remember. Um, I think the the first uh, night, the the debut, it uh, crashed. Right, like the internet was just kind of. Oh yeah, broke yeah. The, the internet or whatever. You yeah, know, I forgot we did the previous yeah. interview before that happened. Yeah, um, it was a Friday the thirteenth. It was uh, July thirteenth, uh, twenty eighteen, 
And of course, we'd worked really hard. It's thir- it was 13-movie marathon, 24-hour uh, horror marathon. And so supposed to start, I think it was supposed to start at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. Um, and so everybody's ready for it to start. And Stephen King gave me a, a great... Um, he, he tweeted about it, and so a lot of people saw the Stephen King tweet. And so everybody's ready to watch it, and that thing comes on your screen where it's just... You yeah, know, I, was just one, a, I was one of them. It's just a circle on your it. screen, <laughs> and it's like... And the internet went crazy and uh, with... Uh, you know, God damn it! I you know I paid for this you know streaming service and it's not working. And where is the show? And and uh, so I was kind of oblivious to this. Obviously, the thing I'd worked hardest on is the opening ten minutes of the show. <laughs> you know, because I'm like saying, here's what we're going to be doing. Yeah, yeah. And so Darcy came over to me and said, nobody can get the show. Nobody can um, access the show. And I said, oh my God! And she says. Uh, isn't that great? And I'm like, <laughs> no, nobody can watch the show. No, that's not great. And she says, oh no, this is great. You broke the internet. And and I said, what do you mean? And she says, the shutter shutter is down. Mm. And actually, two other. So you IFC. can watch them all on Shutter. They're all on there now, so <laughs> yeah. you could you can go back and you watch them. You can watch them it now. Yeah. But IFC was down. Sundance was down. We broke other. We broke other <laughs> networks. And so she says, "Oh, this is great! It's like so many people want to watch it that nobody can watch it." And I said, "That's not great. That's not great. We worked really hard on this. Well, you it know? was it was like a forty-eight hour marathon <laughs> where it came back in, but when it came back in, it was like I think it was like sometime in the middle of the night, and yeah. then like, but it was going on all weekend because you showed like I don't know like a bunch of films that that weekend, and yeah." Uh, we we weren't going to immediately show it again, but because so many people couldn't see it, mm-hmm. we immediately showed it again. Um, and so, um, I guess yeah, I mean, it turned out all right because you know here here we are still doing it. But <laughs> at the time, <laughs> at the time, it was it was um, it was kind of scary. People come up, still come up to me and say, "Hey, remember that night you broke the internet?" And I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> Yeah, they're like, what do you mean? Yeah, my first one minute on the show. Yeah, well, we broke the internet. <laughs> um, wow. So and Darcy's been really great. Um, I like the time when she did the drive-in totals. I think she was the oh, first yeah. person to ever do the drive-in totals uh, well, after you, right? Yeah, well, that's because, I, you know, about 15 years ago, I, I took a role in this – ultra low budget movie called hogzilla about a giant killer hog and um it never got finished the movie never got finished and i was kind of happy that it never got finished to tell you the (laughs) truth and um darcy heard about it and she went and found the director and producer and she um uh, helped them finish the movie just so she could bring it to the show and show it on the show and i was like Darcy, that's not a good movie. And she's like, I don't care. It's like Hogzilla. There was this whole movement to have Hogzilla on the show. And so when they finally put it on the show, Darcy did the drive-in totals for Hogzilla. And uh, I don't think anyone has clamored to see Hogzilla again (laughs) after that one screening. But I think it is still up on the service somewhere. You can watch Hogzilla if you want to. (laughs) So she's also been preserving the uh the old monster visions from yeah, right here um darcy i had all the old monster visions and all the old last uh, the um uh drive-in theaters in a warehouse and um never did anything with them and people would say you ever gonna put those out and i was like well i don't have rights to the movies you know all mm-hmm. i have is the stuff in between mm-hmm. the movies and um so i never did anything with them and Darcy went in and uh, got took the tapes, figured out. I mean, in some cases, we're talking about tapes from the um, '80s that were on outdated types of technology that nobody so knows not, how to deal with it today. Is so it like because uh, there's beta, Sony, right? But then there's Sony one-inch tape is some of it. Mm, or, Umatic is it that kind? Or um, like? I don't know what you call yeah. it exactly, but. She went and found people in L.A. that knew how to transfer it. Uh, 
you know, people that happen to have this antiquated equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and she uh, set up a Patreon where she's gradually um, rehabbing the old footage and putting it up. And so, and oh, wow. so yeah, the, so those drive-in theaters and those um, monster visions are one by one appearing. And in some cases, it's kind of embarrassing because she'll say, remember that time you interviewed uh, so-and-so? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> because I was, on, I was on 52 weeks a year, yeah. double feature, probably averaged 120 movies a year for, I don't know, 16, 17 years. So however many hours of, of TV that is, it's, it's 20,000 plus hours of TV. <laughs> I <laughs> can so, imagine, yeah. So sometimes there are, there are shows that I don't, you know, that are not vivid in my memory. Mm -hmm. You know what's vivid in my memory is the bad ones. Oh, yeah. That's the stuff like um, we had a movie called Super Beast, Oh, and, I remember that one. <laughs> you remember <laughs> Super Beast? You're the only yeah. person that remembers <laughs> Super Beast. Made oh. in the Philippines. Um, I don't even think there was a beast. I don't think they ever found the beast. They yeah, were, yeah. They were like oh, wandering right. we around did. in the jungle for two hours looking for the beast. That's right. Yeah, I think we <laughs> talked about it last time. Now, I remember, yeah. yeah. It's, it's one of those movies where, you know, because it would come on TV and um, uh, you wouldn't know anything about it other than just a little log line in the TV guide. You're like, okay, I'm going to check that out. And... You're watching it. Sometimes you have a tape recording, and you're like, "What? What's going on in this movie? There's, where's the beast?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think some of those movies like survived on the basis of their title yeah. for years. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> like the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies. I can't believe you did that from memory. <laughs> That's uh, that is actually that is the the title of the movie. And yeah, very few people can ever remember the name of that movie. Yeah. I think at the time that they made that movie, oh, you did a commentary on it once. Yeah, who is that guy? Um, Ray Dennis Steckler, I think, is the uh, is the director and star of the incredibly mixed up zombies. Yeah, yeah. No, the incredibly mixed strange up, creatures, the, became, the incredibly who, strange creatures who stopped living, who stopped living and, and became mixed up zombies. Yeah, not died, but stopped <laughs> living. <laughs> I think that was um, uh, their idea. Was it was the longest title in film history? Yeah, but yeah. because it was the longest title in film history, it wouldn't fit on anybody's marquee, mm -hmm. and so it, it would it would be incredibly strange or it would be mixed up zombies or it would be some other like short yeah, version yeah. of the title but um i think they made they actually made money on that film it's a mm. very very strange film without having much to show for their for their efforts <laughs> so the monster visions the old ones are going up like one at a time kind of just yeah slowly, like yeah they're going up on the pay the lost drive-in Lost drive-in, as a as a as opposed to the last drive-in, mm -hmm. the lost drive-in Patreon that uh, that Darcy the male girl runs. Uh, she's the first male girl that's actually been a hardcore horror fan uh, and really knows what she's talking about. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the previous male girls were just models. Yeah, so. I can tell she's really into this stuff. You know? Yeah, no, she's the ultimate. Um, uh, fangirl. She was going to the conventions and doing the cosplays long before I ever met her. Oh, cool. So. Yeah, even like underrated films like Halloween 3 and uh, Exorcist 3. and Yeah, you know. she kind of uh, she kind of, we've had an ongoing thing about Halloween 3 because oh, yeah, yeah. when it first came out I gave it a half a star. And, I think uh, everybody did. No. <laughs> and, so, and so she loves Halloween 3 and she yeah. loves Tom Atkins and um and so she's saying, when are we going to show Halloween 3? And I say, never. And she's <laughs> like, you know, no, we have to show the Halloween 3. And she got this whole big uh, movement going to where now I can't go anywhere without somebody coming up to me in a Halloween 3 t-shirt saying, oh, yeah. when are you going to show Halloween 3? <laughs> and to which I always answer, never. <laughs> and so uh, actually at this year's Jamboree, uh, which is in July in, in Memphis, she, I, I allowed her to program Friday night not thinking in in my head what might happen and we we have had trouble getting the rights to halloween three on the show oh really okay but she didn't have any trouble getting theatrical rights to halloween three oh, okay. <laughs> and so she programmed halloween three and she got 
Tom Atkins and the director Tommy Lee Wallace and the ac- uh, lead actress uh, Stacy Nelkin all to come to the show on Friday night at the Jamboree so that they can gang up on me <laughs> and make me defend my opinion of Halloween 3. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've already heard from Tom Atkins. He's ready to, he's, he's ready to rumble. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so- <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Are there any films that um, you haven't shown yet that you want to? Oh, there are lots of films I want to show that, that uh, I haven't been able to show. Yeah. Or ones that uh, you could name, I should say. <laughs> I mean, well, the previous problems I had at the other two networks were censorship problems. For example, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was on the Two Grizzly for Cable list for years and years and years, and I never showed it. I was able to show it on Shutter. There's another one that's still on everybody's Two Grizzly to Air list, and that's I Spit on Your Grave. The 1978 I Spit on Your Grave. Nobody will show it. Mm. I think it would be actually be easy to get the rights to it. I, we just can't show it for other reasons. It's considered beyond the pale, you know, mm. even though it, it's a rape revenge movie. Mm-hmm. And even though the woman gets her revenge and she triumphs at the end. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and originally it was conceived as a feminist film. It was called Day of the Woman. Mm-hmm. Um, because of the graphic rape scenes, uh, nobody wants to touch it, you know. It actually destroyed Mayor Zarki's career, mm. <laughs> he, the director. Um, there are lots of movies from the... I, I would love to show the Val Luton movies uh, that, that, uh, oh, that were done at RKO yeah. uh, in mm. the 40s. There's a little bit of an aversion of black and white. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of a licensing yeah. problem, I think, with those. Um, you, did, uh, you did manage to show Night of the Living Dead, so that was cool. Um, yeah, we showed Night of the Living Dead because it's... Uh, Little Shop of Horrors, it, Well, too. it's in public domain, yeah, which makes yeah. it easy. <laughs> Little Shop of Horrors, public mm-hmm. domain. Um, but um, uh, I would like to show more stuff from the 30s, kind of a neglected decade in horror. Uh, but mm-hmm. the fans want 80s. I don't know what it is about the 80s, but they're like 80s, 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 more 80s, more 80s. It does seem that way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, And so um, we show a lot of stuff from the 80s. And we've recently we've started showing quite a bit from the 70s as well. Um, but that's sort of the sweet spot for horror fans. It's like mm-hmm. they and, – and it doesn't – it's not just people who grew up in the 80s. It's – younger people it's older people it's like there's something about the 80s that um uh there's there's some there's a there's an opinion forming that the 80s were the golden age of horror (laughs) i'm not sure that that's true but it definitely is a specific age for sure and it had you know i think it's that all varieties of horror were in the 80s Mm -hmm. i mean it's like it was kind of a wild west atmosphere where you could make movies really cheap and get them into mom and pop video stores really fast. Oh yeah, yeah. And so there were there were a lot of uh, anything that could be shot f- uh, cheap uh, would end up in the v- in the video store. So you had a lot of guys who normally wouldn't have a chance to make movies, but they could because they could make a sixty thousand dollar movie in nineteen eighty four and actually get it distributed. Uh, and that carried over a little bit into the nineties, but it was replaced by the erotic thriller. And we had this like four mm-hmm. or five year period where everybody was making these erotic thrillers. Well, directors and producers love those because all it takes is four people in a house. <laughs> you don't really need you don't really need a lot of production value on an yeah. erotic thriller. It's all about the sex. It's all about the sex and the betrayal and the psychological mystery and everything. And so um I would say half of them starred Shannon Tweed. Shannon Tweed was the erotic thriller <laughs> queen of the of the early '90s, and I, I guess we just exhausted what you can do with the erotic thriller because at some point it just stopped. the The last really good one I think was um, Wild Things, which was done by um, James McNaughton. I think. Oh, okay. Anyway, that movie, uh, Wild Things, was. Um, it, it, it wasn't the last erotic thriller, but it was the sort of the last erotic thriller of that era. And a lot of people think the erotic thriller was killed by uh, showgirls, that the reaction to showgirls was so negative oh. <laughs> that, that they stopped funding the erotic thrillers. But 
Huh. Who knows? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People get tired of genres just just like they get tired of certain stars and they get tired oh, yeah. of certain themes, you know? Yeah, yeah, it always happens. Yeah, I've, I've so, always tended to not like whatever's popular at the moment, but then like it later. It kind of needs to pass be, and become retro, I guess. Exactly. I, I mean, yeah. I, I, think, I think a lot of people... People like to, people are always looking for the hidden gem. Mm -hmm. And they often ask me, are there any like forgotten gems that you, that you want to show? And I'm like, you know, in the age of internet indexing and IMDB, I'm not sure there are any truly forgotten gems. I mean, it's like, even if it was made by your, um, you know, even if it was made when you were in middle school in 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 uh, in 1974, it's probably on IMDb. <laughs> there's probably somebody who knows about it. Yeah, you know? yeah. So there's such a thing as too much information, and so we don't we can't we can't go into any movie uh, with innocence. I remember when I first started reviewing movies, uh, they were at the drive-in. There was no. Um, video and uh there was no advanced publicity on them and so usually all i knew was the title mm -hmm. and the ex exploitation ad that was in the newspaper that day which always had you know lurid images on it and that was it i just like went to the drive-in watched the movie and it was gone in a week and then a new movie came in and I watched that one and um, there's something to be said for that kind of innocence about going to the movies because you're exposed to a lot more uh -huh. than if you, you know, if the sixth sense came out today, mm -hmm. wouldn't there be an internet article like the the day before it comes out saying, let's talk about the ending of the sixth oh, sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't think you could, I, I don't think you can ever mm -hmm. go to a movie anymore yeah. without knowing something about it. Yeah. Even if you try it's sort of like yeah. It's sort of like when you can't watch the football game, and so you record it, mm. and then eight hours later you have to say to everybody, "Don't tell me the score. Don't tell me the score. Don't oh, tell yeah. me the score." It's like you would have to do that yeah, in order yeah. to go to a movie without knowing anything about it. So. <laughs> yeah, I think the the ending to Planet of the Apes is on the VHS cover. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah, oh, that's terrible. That's just yeah. terrible. Oh, Night yeah. Living Dead. They they show the ending on the back of the box. Like there's like. Or no, I think there's even one where it's the cover. I think it might even be the front cover. It just shows uh, Dwayne Jones being dragged into the fire. It's like, how do that's, you ruin that's the- That's horrible. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah, because I remember when I saw that, I was like, I couldn't believe that he didn't make it. I was like, he fought so hard to stay alive, that whole movie. And then he just is shot. And I, I, I was like, oh my God, like that really like struck me. But now it's it's like nothing. It's like you see- And, and yeah. if you were watching the movie and you happen to have the box there- Mm -hmm. You would know he's the only black guy in the movie, mm -hmm. and so that's him. You know? Yeah, <laughs> that's terrible. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. So another thing I want to say about the last drive and uh, the music on the show is great. I really like the. Uh, that's John Brennan. He does all the uh, the lyrics and yeah. the, the music and everything, right? Yeah. Um, well, um, yeah. John Brennan is a member of the last drive-in crew. Um, he's among other things our driver for the show <laughs> and um when we were doing the the original uh marathon we had we showed the movie uh legend of boggy creek mm -hmm. and and we had a a bigfoot expert uh come on the show and the bigfoot expert also had a band and so i wanted to sing the theme of the of the legend of boggy creek with the bigfoot expert assuming he would do that bring and so i said bring your guitar and he was like I don't. I don't really want to do that. I don't really want to do that. Okay. And John Brennan said, "I, you know, I can play guitar. We'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll back you up on the Legend of Boggy Creek." And so that's how John Brennan became the musical director yeah, yeah. of <laughs> of the Last Drive-In. And since then, I think he's written fifty songs for the oh, yeah, for the yeah. show. <laughs> and um, uh, he always comes up with something interesting. And now he's he's he has a band called. John Brennan and the Big Feet. Oh, they pl did they play at the uh, Mahoning Drive-In? They did I play I, there, I and they'll yeah, play yeah. this year at the yeah. at the Jamboree in Memphis. And he's he's become this uh, well-known songwriter, you know, performer, and uh, uh, very funny guy, very talented guy. 
um, and it adds a whole new. And he wrote the theme song for the show, so he it's it adds a whole new dimension to the show when we do those musical interludes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the theme song is so catchy. Like I like that the song or that the show has its own theme song. As soon as it starts up, it like gets you into the mood. Yeah, uh, yeah. One thought I had, I was curious. Is there any? I mean, I don't know if, if you know you have the rights or anything, but is there any thought of bringing back the old Monster Vision song in some part of the last drive-in? Actually, we have talked about bringing back the Monster Vision song. Yeah, and uh, I think John Brennan does a version of it. I think he did a version of it at the Mahoning Drive-in. Uh, oh but, yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, we we might as well. I don't think anybody else wants to sing that song. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah the Monster Monster Vision also had a theme song, or it was actually a promotional video for the uh, for the show. Mm-hmm. But. Um, uh, yeah, I've always wanted to start my, I do a live show called How Redneck Saved Hollywood, and I've always wanted to uh, start it off with singing Convoy, the song Convoy, uh, which most people are not old enough to remember when Convoy was a number one hit, but it has these three backup singers who go, Convoy, <laughs> you know, and then, and it's a, it's a, it's a narrative, it's a powerful narrative uh, song. And um, so John Brennan has agreed to, you know, score that for me and uh, get together some, uh, some backup singers. And so we're, we're, we're thinking about adding a, a musical element to the How Redneck Saved Hollywood show. Oh, and cool. uh, I, should also, I should also mention I'm, I'm partnering with the American Film Genre Archive. Okay. The American Film Genre Archive is a nonprofit in Austin, Texas that goes and rescues talk about forgotten gems mm. they go and rescue these old exploitation films that are um withering away in in warehouses somewhere you know they restore the print and they distribute them um to whoever wants to have retro nights at theaters and so um they said you know you, you want to look at our catalog and i said do i want to look at your catalog that's like crack to me and so it's like 6,000, they have these 6,000 movies. So I'm going to start hosting these at various venues around the country, sort of like the, uh, you know, your usual suspects, like the Colonial Theater in Phoenixville. Oh, yeah, here. yeah. Um, theaters like the, I don't know, Music Box in Chicago, the Texas Theater in Dallas, the Coolidge Corner Theater in Boston, the Hollywood Theater in Portland. These are, these are um, uh, theaters that embrace retro movies and you know that have have a strong um uh audience for cult films oh another thing i wanted to comment and you know we talked about last time too but how on the set of monster vision you hear the crew laughing off camera and stuff yeah um i mean i think originally a, a crew on a tv set is told not to make any noise and so um originally when i was doing the show uh, if, if I said something that made a crew member laugh, you know, they'd do, you know, they'd do this thing, you know, cover their mouth and, and, and turn their head away from the mic and everything. And, but occasionally you tell a joke that's so good, they can't, you know, stop from the guffaw. And so <laughs> we noticed that when that would happen, uh, people liked it. Mm-hmm. And so I just said, you know, let's just leave the sounds of the crew on the on the soundtrack. And so it did pre- it did create a loose atmosphere. And you know, it sounds kind of hollow cuz you know, it's the third cameraman and he's like and and he's and he's laughing or commenting from way over here. And then I had a I I had a floor director named um Ernie who was a cinephile himself and um he w- he would occasionally just chime in with uh lines from the movie you know just he would just suddenly remember a line from the movie and he would say it in a funny accent and i don't think nobody ever saw ernie on the screen <laughs> but you could hear his voice uh, and so um uh and so it just developed organically it wasn't anything that we planned but um but then i had to always tell people who were new to the show it's okay to laugh it's okay to you know <laughs> it's okay to make noise we don't care and so that's 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 how that developed. And I still 
uh, I still tell people it's okay to make noise, but a hardcore crew guy who's been working on shows for so long, he's just so, he's just, he's just, that just seems so foreign to him to ever make a sound <laughs> that a lot of guys won't, you know, a lot of yeah, guys yeah. can't get into it. I remember Rodney Dangerfield would say, like on the set of Caddyshack, because he, he was used to doing stand up comedy and getting the laugh all the time. So when he went on, when he, they were filming Caddyshack and everybody's just quiet the whole time, he's like, What's going on here? I'm bombing. I'm bombing. Like nobody's laughing. And, you know, just <laughs> not being used to a film set. It's true. You don't know, you, you don't know when you're scoring, um, uh, when when you don't have the live audience. That's one reason I like doing these shows with the live audience because, mm -hmm. you know, right away. You, oh yeah, you, yeah. Either doing it or you're oh not. yeah. Oh, I was there actually for the um the last time you came around to the uh, Colonial Theater. Um, mm. actually, funny, just coincidence. I'm wearing the the Bluebird hat uh, from the distillery down the street. Okay. And I remember you're making jokes about Bluebird, and people were just cracking up like like tears. Like people were just crying. They were <laughs> laughing so hard. <laughs> Oh, yeah. that's great. That's great. I, I, I love the colonial. That's, that's yeah, a, yeah. Uh, a lot of times on the show, you'll go into a tangent beforehand before you show the movie. How much of that is planned? Um, but it depends on the show. Um, uh, there are some things where I'm kind of ad adapting uh, things that I've already written, you know, for, in some other, you know, I've written as a column or something. For example, when, uh, when Gillette, uh, when Gillette made that crazy commercial about, you know, the, uh, the shaving, a, uh, yeah, the yeah. big, the, the big, like, uh, socially conscious, uh, shaving commercial. <laughs> I had written a piece about it where I like went second by second through the commercial to say, what's going on here? What's going on here? What's going on here? What the, what are they talking about here? You know, because <laughs> it, it was, what, what's their slogan? It's like as close as, uh, the best a man can get. That's their slogan. And so for years, that meant the best shave a man can get. And they did this commercial turning it into the best men we can be. <laughs> and, so, and so I thought, have I been misreading this all of these years? You know, I said, I said this really bothers me because Gillette makes such a fucking good razor. They make that Gillette Fusion 5 thing. And I was talking about, you know, and so I went into this whole thing about how the Fusion 5 Pro Shield works. And then I went back to the commercial and then I was talking about how, you know, in the old days, Gillette advertised on the fights, the Friday night fights, because my grandfather was a big fan of the Friday night fights. And then Emil Griffith killed uh, Benny Perrette on, uh, in a match on a Gillette Friday night fight. And so for a while I thought, well, Gillette probably won't do this anymore. And this, no, they were right back there the next week. So wow. that, did, that didn't bother them, you know. The, the, the death of Benny Perrette did not bother Gillette in the slightest. Oh. But they were, they, were, they were bothered by, and it was hard to say what, exactly what they were bothered by. They were bothered by this guy chatting up a girl on the street in the commercial, you know, that's not cool. It's not cool to chat up a girl on the street and say, this is the worst they can come up with that men do. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is the worst example of male behavior they can come up with to say, that's not the best a man can get. And so I did the, anyway, I did this whole rant about Gillette, but it, it had actually been written down before because I had to remember what all of the um, segments were in the, in the commercial. The commercial is wild, and they said this this is the new Gillette. We're gonna, you know, and then like six months later, it's like nobody's doing that anymore. The, you know, the commercial's gone. They're not doing that anymore. They're back to the Fusion Pro Shield Five is the closest shave you'll ever get. <laughs> well, that's what I thought you meant. Because <laughs> you weren't involved in anything before that, like. Because TNT's Monster Vision before that, I don't think anything overlapped. Like any of their bumpers that they previously used were on um, your show. No, I mean before I came along, they they would have various guest hosts do mm -hmm. Monster Vision. Yeah, and I think the longest running ones were um, Penn and Teller. Did yeah did it for, did for it like for, one month basically? Yeah. yeah, every Saturday. I've always wanted to see if like somebody could find the Penn and Teller tapes and like because all that stuff was just like. It aired, and that was it. You know, it's like gone. It's like yeah. unless you taped it off TV. I bet it doesn't exist because 
the only reason my stuff still exists mm -hmm. is that I saved it. And for part of that time, it was my production company that was doing it. And so mm -hmm. simply, simply because they didn't want to do it, <laughs> simply because TNT didn't care. <laughs> and so, yeah. and so, um, and so I had all the original tapes, but, um, but I think, see, it wasn't considered real programming because it wasn't the actual program that was on. It was, it, the the technical term for it in TV is interstitial programming, and it means hosted shows. Mm -hmm. And and I was nominated twice for the Cable Ace Award back when they had Cable Ace Awards, but the category was something like it, it was something like um, interstitial short form. So you would so the other the other uh, nominees would be things like uh, the National Geographic Children's uh, uh, short on caterpillars, <laughs> you know, and then and then Joe Bob's Monster Vision, you know, <laughs> same kind of same kind of interstitial yeah, yeah. programming. Well, anyway, you've definitely taught us a lot about the films, and like you've made us feel, um, how do I say, like made us feel validated for liking these kind of films because a lot of times, you know, you would think. Lots of people would see these films and just say, you know, these are trash or like, why are you watching them? These are a waste of time. But, you know, you've shown that there's merit to these films. And uh, yeah, I get that a lot, I, especially when people grew up in a in a family where their parents hated the films that they were watching and told them to stop watching them or their school didn't like the films that they wanted to show in class or the. Uh, you know, or they, they had some kind of active opposition to their film choices. Mm -hmm. And so they started to doubt themselves. Uh, and a lot of people have, have told me that they said, you know, there was, but I, I knew monster vision was there and you were, you were endorsing these films that I was being uh, hassled about. And, um, and, uh, that's, that's why so many, so many quote misfits sort of band together in the, in the, horror and exploitation film world um uh because it was you know uh it was a it was a joint passion that they had in a in a world that despised their passion you know and uh i love that about the the family that grows up around certain films and certain and the family has grown up around this show um uh, the last drive-in and the two previous shows a day doesn't go by that I don't get some kind of, you know, letter, email message saying, um, you know, I was a shut-in kid and uh, you were my friend. <laughs> so, and you you can't take credit for it. It wasn't like that wasn't our purpose in mm -hmm. you know in in doing the doing the show. But it but it does make you want to like make the show good. <laughs> when you do it because you don't know who's you know, you don't know who's like really needs to watch it yeah you, know? you don't know who's on the other side yeah yeah well joe bob briggs check him out on the last driving on shutter and also you can see him live check out how redneck saved hollywood yeah and you can come to the joe bob's drive-in jamboree in memphis uh between um july 8 to 10 uh this year at the Malco Summer Drive-In, the immortal Malco Summer Drive-In. It's yeah. been there since, I don't know, the 40s, I think. So. Well, <laughs> yeah, check out any future dates. And yeah, thanks for watching. <laughs>